Be a good doggy. Okay, again, uh, to our friends in house and our friends online, welcome to another Rosicrucian Mass. Uh, we're just about two days before the equinox, so we'll give some early greetings of the equinox itself. And today I'm going to talk about Gnosis and Gnosticism, uh, those not really being the same thing. Uh, one might practice Gnosticism to attain Gnosis, but Gnosis is the attainment. Uh, in that regard, it's easier to ask what is Gnosticism than what is Gnosis. So we'll tackle Gnosticism first. Gnosticism is doctrinal, which can get in the way of individual experience, as it generates a, a tendency to, perform, to form a belief structure. So Gnosticism then becomes a bit more about group think, uh, which is not necessarily an issue when we're forming a congregation. We're looking for that uh, uh, a certain uh, group identification in, in that being the nature of our community. We want people to care for the community that they dwell within. Uh, so that we can say that uh, Gnosticism as a doctrine can hold um, methods of correspondence that, in a sense, are mutually agreed upon in, in a community setting. And it's interesting, I have a little note here. Um, uh, the Kabbalah can denote you know, uh, this as a mapping of the human soul. So we are talking about the soul when we talk about Gnosis, and hence we must be talking about that at some level as uh, Gnosticism itself. And it is interesting that in the Kabbalah we must work in um, groups, lineages, whatever. A Kabbalist does not really work alone. And, and I think where that really shows it, for those that are familiar with the Kabbalah, where that really shows it is in the fact that the Kabbalah relates to sacred text, and we're looking for deeper meaning inside that sacred text. So if we're all searching for something together, we have, we have the benefit of each other's head in finding um, hidden gematric correspondences, hidden notaricons, things that can be found inside of a text. And when, when, when you put uh, more than one head in that room, two heads are better than one, and you know when more than one is gathered in my name, et cetera, et cetera. So, getting back to Gnosticism, those things that hold us together are, are, are certain doctrinal tenets, we can say. We hold the belief that, you know, um, that we hold the idea that belief in any deity is superstitious. Um, we, we, we say in our own doctrine that we don't believe in the divine, but that we offer a certain way that one can come to know the divine. So if you walked up to me on the street and said, you know, do you believe in God? I would say no. But I, I would say I don't have to believe in God. If, you, if, if I walked up to you on the street and you asked me, do I believe in you? I'd say, yeah, I believe in you. I see you here right in front of me. I believe enough that my perception is you know, accurate. And if I get to know you, I believe in you that much more. You know, I can believe in a friend to the point where uh, I can trust that friend and, and open up to that friend. Or um, I could, that friend could ask me to lend him five bucks and I could feel confident that I'll get my five bucks back because I believe in that friend. But that's based on experience. I've, I've lent him five bucks before or I'm dependent on our mutual affection for each other. Those kinds of things. So, our belief is a practical belief. Um, and our doctrine is then a method, you know, or a praxis. You know, our doctrine, our doctrine is focused on the individual. We do hold that the individual is sacred, but in that sacredness, we also hold that the group, the community, is sacred too. And we, we recognize the need for both. In this light, though, also, we don't declare a moral code as Gnostics, practicing Gnosticism, because we recognize the, the individual uh, reality of every person, and every person is working out their own morality. 
So we're not going to have some kind of moral structure that you either adhere to or don't adhere to, or you're sinful if you can't adhere to, or whatever. We recognize that you yourself will do what's right for you. Now, that doesn't mean we all will come to same, some of the same conclusions. We might all decide that murder is immoral, for example. However, we do recognize that in other churches and temples and whatever, that more, when morality comes in, I thought he's really having a good time. Uh, when morality comes in, uh, it's usually coming in to replace spirituality because the spirit has abandoned that temple and uh, morality rushed in to fill the void. So, our doctrine is then about a practice, a shared philosophical perspective, and that's where our community goes. Um, but we have first to uh, recognize two essential problems as Gnosticism. Um, ancient Gnosticism is also discussed as if there was one cosmogony. So when somebody asks us, you know, are you a Gnostic? Um, they, they, they will assume or presume that uh, we have a certain beliefs. For example, uh, it's often said of ancient Gnostics that Gnostics hated this world, and the god of this world is really a demiurge, a creator god that created a false world. And certainly our Gnosticism here at the Gnostic Church of Light is quite different. We're not trapped in matter. There is no evil world. We love this world. We love ourselves. And... Um, as a matter of fact, we uh, even propose some, an, an idea quite different. We're not trapped in matter. We're not souls trapped in this world, in this body. But indeed, we are souls, uh, we are spirit liberated in matter. Spirit gets the chance to build the soul here. Spirit gets a chance to express itself. So, in this, we identify with Thelema, but we can identify with Jungian traits too, and, and both... Crowley is the founder of Thelema, and Jung is the, the uh, really the founder of, um, shall we say, the psychological version of modern Gnosticism. Um, we can identify with both of these, and uh, we recognize, you know, a modern gnosis as opposed to an ancient gnosis. That doesn't mean we don't, um, we don't, you know, recognize some of the doctrines of some of the sects of ancient. Uh, Gnostics. Uh, for example, the, the Sethians are, are quite akin to what we're about uh, today. So there was at least one group I know of that would have practiced a very similar uh, Gnosticism to what we recognize in their time. Um, today, too, and, and I've talked about this in previous sermons, today, too, uh, we look to create sanctuary here as a community so that our Gnosticism uh, seeks to create a place where the genius and the individual person can manifest. Um, so our, our group think is really towards each other, towards giving each other uh, credulity. And you know, I think that really corresponds for those that are following us online to follow our group. Um, an article that I put up yesterday, which called about called uh, on tact as a way of uh, dealing with society in a time of individualistic uh, repression. Uh, they go back, for example, to the German times and the brown shirts as they invaded society. When we start to accept people as um, generic, a generic person, and all people are the same way, no matter how we're going to fill in that same way. Um, we remove the humanity and the individuality. So in tact, in expressing tact towards each other, we're reasserting that that person is an individual. We may be all Gnostics, and we may all follow the same doctrinal code as a community, as a congregation, as a church, but that doesn't make us all the same people. We're all individuals. We all have our own individual quirks. We all have our own individual ideas. We all have our own individual emotional lives, etc. So um, we're just really about helping people find their genius in their own individual way without the application of an across-the-board moral structure. So now let's move to that individual and um, let's... Let's see what brings that individual 
to their individuality. I mean, first there has to be a disdain for uh, authority and orthodoxy in some way, shape, or form. Uh, because the individual recognizes him or herself as their own authority. And um, that can make the individual be a misfit, or at least an anarchistic type character, which can make community and congregation uh, a little bit on uh, the difficult side. But again, that, with that tact, that feature, it does not have to be so. And indeed, you know, aren't we all, when we come to a place like this, aren't we pulling away from our social conditioning? Aren't we pulling away from the uh, group think, the, uh, the herd mentality? Uh, and once we do, that turf is not well defined. There's no signposts on the way as there are inside the herd mentality. There's nobody to help you do right. Okay, so we, we say that one needs to strive for control over one's thoughts, control over one's emotions. Uh, and indeed, we must recognize that that control is necessary as we go uh, into that unexplored country that really is the human soul. Um, in seeking to know oneself, the individual is really tie, trying to understand the inner and the outer realities through the various modes of perception that are available. Uh, we can note at the outset that you know finding the real soul is um, you know has needs to be free of that mindless conditioning. Uh, we need to get past the machine that that teaches us really to develop as machines inside our head. Um, I have a quote here from Carl Jung, I believe. Um, People measure their self-knowledge by what the average person in their social environment knows of himself, but not by the real psychic facts, which are for the most part hidden from them. So we need to go into uh, understanding the nature of the psyche. This is why Jung is so important to modern Gnosticism. Um, and we need to hold up our own holy writ as um, you know, direct revelation and open that, um, we need to open that, uh, that body of work to, to something that is living and anyone can contribute, you know, that, that has the quality of character to produce that kind of work so that our revelations, you know, the dreams and interpretations that we bring into sacred, uh, sacred scripture um, and our holy books uh, must be a canon that, that is growing and, and not frozen in time. And because when you freeze a canon, that's when you start pushing the spirit out of a, a church and a system. The canon must be open um, to keep the system alive. Uh, for the individual developing things such as you know, wakeful dreaming, the daydreaming, the creative process that comes through this, through the ruminations about our own lives, the scryings that we do, um, this can put us into contact with the archetypal realm. This is where the mages and the prophets have always gone. Um, and so Carl Jung bids you know, the men to dip into their anima and the women into their animus so that you know, we're, that's the inner part of, of uh, each of these genders. In other words, the inner part of the female is male and the inner part of the male is female. So that we become these psychic holes and we start pulling out this archetypal reality uh, because on one level we are all doing the same thing. We are all trying to come alive and take ourselves from that inner into the outer life and take that outer life and bring it within us. So in doing that, our knowledge is not the knowledge that you might put into a dictionary or an encyclopedia. Um, you know, Gnosis refers to a knowledge that transcends knowledge, a higher knowledge, uh, you know, uh, an acquired knowledge that comes through empirical reasoning as much as it does from rational thought. Okay, it's also intuitive, and and it's coming from that archetypal, that internal plane that we can even call, you know, prider, the preternatural contact. So, and this, when it gets that good, it's called prophecy. So, 
But immediately Gnosis invo is involved with a depth of mind that is ultimately timeless. And uh, th through its attainment, one achieves what some religions have called salvation, especially the Christian religion. But we don't necessarily need that soteriological perspective. We don't necessarily need to focus on an immortality. We just need to focus on who we are. And we need to recognize something that traditional churches have removed from. Traditional churches give us this lie that immortality is immediately guaranteed to us on birth. You're either going to heaven or hell, but you're going to be immortal. And we're saying the soul is not a given. You know, it's, it's something that must be created, something that must be built and, and constructed. Okay, um, and that comes through the creation and formulation of a personality. So it's the personality that we're attempting to build, and the personality is the God in us, and the key to uh, who and what we are. So I hope you'll ruminate on that for a little bit and enjoy it uh, as best you can. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Mass, and we'll move on to the... Uh, Eucharist of the Five Elements. Thank you.